My name is Bahit Chitsos, part of Elite Mastermind Group. Thank you for being here this morning, this afternoon. Go ahead and introduce yourself to everybody. Let us know where you're coming in from. We're back. I have We're good. clear reception on my end. Yeah, I have clear reception on my end. <laughs> Fantastic. Go ahead and introduce yourself for everybody. Let us know where you're tuning in from. I'm here from Birmingham, Alabama. I'm taking my earbuds out in case they are causing problems. Is that right. better? Now I can, I, can, I can hear you pretty clearly. Go ahead. Right. You're good. So here's my first question. Tell us a little bit about your book. I love the title. I haven't put my hands on it yet, but I like the title. My book is called Annihilator of Innocence, and it's about my life uh, where uh, my children and I, we were held hostage for two years by a stranger uh, that took over my home. And uh, I traveled as a speaker right after I wrote the book, uh, traveling with people speaking about domestic violence and uh, stuff like that. And although I had went through that, my real focus was talking about strangers and stalking. That's what I really wanted to talk about. So I would segue to my story uh, and to be able to tell people about it. So uh, the name of the book, Annihilate of Innocence, talks about this stranger that came into my life, stalking me on my job. And he had been stalking me for some time on my job. And I did not know who he was. I had never met him before. And one day he shoved me on the elevator at my job. and. Um, Finally, I said, what about my children? Um, and he let me go. And I'm thinking I have to run, get home, get my safe haven, and call my job. Uh, but when I got home to my house, he was already there. So that's the gist of the story. Um, so now if you've got any other questions, feel free to ask. I mean, that takes some toughness and some mental uh, stability. I mean, Wow. I, I, I wouldn't even know what to do if that would have happened to me. So well, here's my question. I know a lot of people go through life circumstances and they just never get out of it. So what was the process of you letting that be in the past and move on with your life and be able to talk about it? Well, the, one of the things that happened was I ended up making a choice on how I was going to save my children. And I knew his biggest focus was me. Um, so I, I took an overdose not to die, but I was hoping I would get in the hospital and be able to let someone know uh, what was going on. But when I ended up at the hospital, I was in a coma and I had to relearn everything all over again. Uh, while I was in the coma, uh, detectives was building a case against my perpetrator and the perpetrator was still visiting my bedside um, until he was arrested, uh, but he was arrested for raping my daughter. Uh, and so the, the, the attorney had to take the rape case to bring in the hostage situation. Uh, how I moved forward was I trusted my faith. Um, I didn't have anything else to go on. I had to relearn everything. And I was learning as much as I could in the hospital while I was uh, in recovery. And I was in there several months. But while I was in recovery, the trial was still going on with my, my children. Um, when I got out of the hospital, I had to relearn who I was, everything about myself. And I just so happened to have a business card from a casting director from a movie I had worked in called Ty Kids Like These from Tyndale. It was about special needs kids. And I called her and she says, well, I need some ethnic talent for a movie called Robocop. Uh, Robocop 3 was coming out and In the Heat of the Night was coming out. And I started learning about life on movie sets because I didn't have sense enough to know I couldn't. So when she would call me and say, I need 100 heads, 200 heads, I, would, I, was, I was living in what they call the projects. I didn't have a phone. I was relearning, getting everything. So I, the pay phone in my neighborhood, would, they would call that. And the neighbors knew I was casting for movies. So they would go and say, go get the movie lady. She's got another movie. So they would hold the phone for me. And I would run to the phone and she would tell me how many talents she needed. And I just bring five quarters. I didn't have sense enough to know that I could bring more than five quarters. So I would take five quarters. I would call five people, tell five people to call five people, five people to call five people. And so I would stand there till almost midnight, sometime one o'clock in the morning, casting for the next day to be on the set. So then the next day, 
uh, people that wanted to be on the set would come and join me because they knew I was the casting lady. So they would drive me on the set so they can be in a movie. So that is awesome. God laid that all the awesome. footwork for me. Yeah. Listen, I, I, I don't know how to explain this. There was a joy. It was a treat for me to go pick up the payphone and call somebody. Now that I look back, I'm like, that was so cool. That was like, that was like, that was a task. That was like, you know, pick up your phone and speed dial and just, there was, like I needed the number. I needed to write it down. It's like I had the little phone book. And, I, you know, this is not that long ago that I'm talking many, about, right? Many people don't remember that you actually could get a return call at the payphone. Uh, so right, right, right. I didn't know that. So I would, you know, I, I had everything that on my life from that time forward uh, depended on faith. Because even when I was a hostage, uh, people think hostages are locked up and closed away all the time. And I, I did a speech once called They Walk Among Us. So as a hostage, my perpetrator took me out. I did marches with Mrs. King, um, Jose Williams. I did um, a song on stages as a hostage, you know, because the victims know that the victimizer has weapons while everybody else doesn't. So the person's lives are in the hands of the victim. And even little children will do what's necessary to protect their family. So my kids, even when they went to school, they wouldn't tell because they were afraid, you know. So anytime we were separated, we knew one of us was still a hostage with him. So we would do whatever we could to come back home. And I was only out of his sight maybe twice the whole time I was a hostage. So it becomes like you're surviving for other people. And, and you have to reach a point where, I reached a point where I did not fear death anymore. Um, and there was something that took place where I walked in one day and caught him sexually molesting my daughter. And I was standing right at the door and I backed away from the door and into my master bedroom. And I prayed to God, God, please let me get by and so I can prepare my daughter for what we might have to do. And God let me do that, but I think he suspected that I saw because all that weekend the threats picked up. And you reach a point as a victim when you know that this time the threat is real. This time he's gonna go through with everything because so much was beginning to work against him when people were coming to the house, they was asking about us, you know. Um, and so it's a long story. So <laughs> a lot of people can pull more actually from the book because I try to tell the story. There's a lot that happens each and every day as a victim that you have to condense this big story into a small book. Um, so I'm trying to tell the story in my movie, the prayer that we're working on from the, from the aspects of the survivors and from the two years my daughter spent on in trial on that, you know, up there at that podium testifying with the perpetrator representing himself in court so it's it's a uh, my story is is i call it uh the story of tragedies but the story of will and survival no i think i, I think a lot of us um if i could take it if i could take inspiration from that a lot of us in our businesses in our careers in our endeavors whatever we do Sometimes we are the the hostage. Sometimes we are the prisoners of it, mm -hmm. and we are afraid of what would happen if we go at, outside that comfort zone, outside yeah. that bubble. And yeah. I feel like sometimes having other people share their 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 circumstances and the life challenges mm -hmm. kind of gives us permission to take that leap of faith to let go of that and be free. Even though it's scary, yes. we want to make that move. So I think it's not just just getting stuck at the house or knowing somebody. In business, a lot of people, their competitors have yeah. weapons against yeah. them too. So yeah. it's 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 right there. Obviously, it's not life threatening. Yeah. But that's where I feel like a lot of people need to see and get these stories. We need to get these stories out for them to be know that there is a choice yes now for as me with business um i started out i started my little business using my my pay phone i finally got me a pager 
which meant I had to run to the pay phone because I didn't have to have people in the neighborhood. And they kept coming to me like, we don't have to call you anymore because they had a pager. Uh, and they referred to me as mama because I love to cook. And it just began to be where when I first came out of the hospital, I'm just going to segue. The police tape and stuff was still around my apartment um, because they were still investigating. And I went to the resident manager. I didn't know anything. Uh, and he said, I kept your apartment as you left it because I didn't know if you had died or anything like that. And he said, uh, let's go back to your apartment. So when I went, um, of course, the food that went bad in the refrigerator, but God guided me to evidence I needed for the trial that he had hidden. And I would find things like our social security cards hidden in magazines, uh, you know, pictures and things hidden. Um, there was like 200 tapes where he recorded our life on a daily basis. So I started learning about myself with my own voice and that I was a writer. So I wrote everything in metaphors. I couldn't pray. I wasn't allowed to pray. So I wrote my prayers in metaphor. So my next book that's coming out called a prayer are my metaphoric prayers that I was praying to God. Uh, and so I, I tell people, if I can start a business and be doing what I'm doing, um, trust your faith. The best way I can tell it, because people find it unbelievable that through everything I've been through, that I can run a business. So um, I don't know, I can't put it into words, but I keep my information right here that I see every day. And it says, I have faith in God. I am strong, I am healthy, I am beautiful, I am rich. And then my next line is what I'm going to do, books, movies, be a speaker. And I've done them all. I've done, we've done the uh, trailer for the movie for the prayer that we're working on now. I worked in movies, many movies uh, as a casting person. And then uh, I go down how I'm gonna do this, who I'm gonna use, what type of people I'm gonna need to help me make this happen, to build my team. So I built many teams around different aspects of what I was doing. Uh, and then I go down, go down here and say, what am I gonna do for causes, charities, nonprofits, and stuff like that. So I had a special needs person that just passed last year. Uh, she started early onset Alzheimer's at 29. So I'm going to be telling her story in a book called Gussie Grant, Too Young for Alzheimer's. So I want to design that book where it looks like a children's book because she never progressed past 18 months old in her mental capacities. But she was such a cutie pie. Uh, so this last year, since her death, I just took time away for a long sabbatical to focus on the reinvention uh, of myself to create my next new team for where I'm moving forward to now. So since my hostage situation, I've had a talk show called Living True and Truly Living. Real people tell real stories about real issues. I've um, started a publishing company, Divine Raw Publishing. I've got two books uh, under my company. I've got three more that I'm working on trying to have come out this year and uh, working on this film, The Prayer. So um, it's been a long process. So everybody thinks that a victim just comes out and starts living. Uh, we are a victim of society because for me, I don't have burns, I don't have shots in my body, but I live with amnesia. So I call it the get lost gas syndrome. <laughs> so I, I retalk myself to drive and I tore up the roads learning how to drive again. I mean, literally tore up sidewalks, everything. Um, but I learned to drive because I had a license. I said, oh, I, did I know how to drive? I had to and I, they said, yes, you have a car in the parking lot at the hospital. And when they found my car for me, it was covered with wash me, take care of me. People had wrote messages all over it. And uh, it was just like, I got a car. I have a, I don't know how, I don't remember how to drive it. So this guy taught me in the parking lot at the hospital how to redrive a little bit. Uh, so this cop followed me, took me. I had to follow this cop to guide me home to my house because I didn't know how to get home. Uh, but anyway, I know I'm talking all over the place, but I'm talking. I love it. I love it. It's, it's very inspirational and very informative because once, once we see that, you know, we take, we take it for granted what we have. And I feel like we cherish it and value it more when we get it back the second time. You're like, wow, this is so cool. And I think it's our mindset that goes, okay, I got this. What can I do with it? But before we didn't know. So just a, just a simple phone 
that you and I take for granted Absolutely. on a regular basis, you're like, yes. it's a powerful tool to yes. build a business with. Yes. Yes. And right now, you know, I tell people, everybody's uh, screaming about Zoom meetings. Um, we were kind of doing this way in the past where when we first started trying to do film projects and we tried to meet when Zoom first came out, it was great for us, you know, and then, you know, the phones came out now with FaceTime and stuff like that. But it wasn't just for survival skills. It was like playtime. We can see each other. But now it's a necessary tool. You know, when phones first came out, people, a lot of people didn't have them. It was expensive to have. When cell phones first came out, they was expensive to have. And a lot of people didn't have them. When the laptop came out, that was the magic tool. Uh, but when Wi-Fi came in at that time, uh, cable and all that stuff, you you could bake a cake for a picture to you know to upload of videos when we used to try to share videos. Now it's instant. Uh, so I grew up in a new world and don't remember, didn't re grow up having memory of the old world. So I began to live with, remember my life in pieces. And so, you know, the thing about trying to go to therapy when you're me, when you got this many stories, the therapist now want to just get, get into your story. I'm not getting therapy. I'm therapizing the therapist. I don't know, I don't know if that makes sense. <laughs> so, you that know, is my, awesome. therapist, my therapist told me, let's go to lunch. <laughs> you know? so that I, is so cool. I just forgot. Well, you're that. not in LA. If you were in LA, you would have definitely gone to lunch. But hopefully one day you'll be in our studio. We'll do a real live session with you, with not you just absolutely absolutely i would love to you know <laughs> definitely so let me ask you a question let's say there's people out there and i don't want to talk about religion but i want to talk about faith if yeah. there were one or two suggestions or advice that you will have for us for individuals how they could get reconnected or build the connection much stronger with their faith what would you suggest to them well, one of the things when I do speak, I'm not allowed to talk about religion. I can talk about my faith, but I'm not allowed to talk about religion because I'm speaking to all cultures and I have friends with cultures across the board. Um, one of the things I would tell people to do is meditate. And whatever religion that you're in, pray. And have an idea of what you want to do and meditate on it. Start believing it. Write notes to yourself about what you want to believe. In the mirror, write a positive awareness statement for yourself. Don't be selfish with yourself. God gave you you first. So start learning who you are because we're raised to be a person in the eyes of someone else, your mom, your dad, society, whatever. Who are you and what are your gifts? Research your gifts within yourself because you may have lost that in your years of growing up. In your innocence, you knew what you like. You like art. Are you like playing with blocks, which is construction? You may have liked uh, swimming, which is uh, you might go into an art, go into a place and teach swimming. But just know what your gifts is and expand on that, and then start putting it into action. Start meeting people that are much more educated, much more wiser than you, that wants to be a part of your dream, of your vision. Create yourself a team. I call them a team uh, of educated people. And I'm not talking about educated in the word of book education, but educated in the uh, actions of their visions, like an artist with a canvas, you know, or a piano player with a, you know, and that went and learned a little lessons on knowing the knowledge to say words. But my team, my film team, when we came together, I expressed to them who I am, what my weaknesses are, what are your strengths that I need. And then we work together as a team. And I tell my team, when I go film on my sets, I bring evidence of my case so the kids that's acting, everybody's acting in my movie would know that this is a real story. So they give me all of their energy because they want to be part of this life I'm living. So be a good person when you go after people to help you. I can talk for days on this, you know that. So be a, be a good person, be a believer in yourself and show that energy to others. And those people will come into your into your realm. Now how to finance that, you know, sometimes you may have to finance it yourself, but you know, they always say other people money, but I don't think it's just that, that little simple saying, 
I, I represent the money that I get represents the type of people that I'm going to be dealing with. So if, if the person is a bad person that gives you money, you better know your situation is not going to be that great. <laughs> you know, so think about people that's giving to you and financing to you. Do they want to from their heart and from their soul? And they want to give because they know they are growing with you in what your endeavors are. Listen, I love it. I want to thank you so much for taking this time and being with us this morning, this afternoon. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to do more. Uh, I definitely want to, I'm going to read up more on the book and get okay. a little bit more educated and, and, and kind of spread the word out there to people. Hopefully, it will inspire others. Hopefully, yeah. it will motivate. Hopefully, it will be a, a good help to other individuals. And I want to thank you so much for spreading the word and being strong for all of us. Thank you so much for having me. Friends for life. Definitely. Stay safe. <laughs> Talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>